If you look around, there are so many ways to make a difference. At Capella University, our FlexPath format gives you a different way to earn your degree. Take courses at your speed. Move on whenever you're ready. Education should fit your life. Learn more at capella.edu. Buy four tires and get up to $250 in savings after rebate at Bell Tire's 4th of July sale. Or get even more in Bell Tire gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Plus, get tires as low as $49 after rebate. Get up to $250 in savings. Or get even more in gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Get up to $250 in savings. Choose the lowest tire price, period, at Bell Tire. 100 years of getting folks safely back on the road, fast and affordably. See store at belltire.com for details. Restrictions apply. You are listening to an entertainment program put together by a company called Financial Ineptitude. Anything said on this show is not an endorsement or professional advice. Would you really want to tell a court of law you were suing us because you thought taking financial advice from two idiots on a podcast put out by Financial Ineptitude was a good idea? Really? Clown hats on your face. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to another exciting, electrifying episode here in the China Shop. Step on inside. I'm Shopkeeper Dan. With me, as always, is Kyle, creator of FinancialNeptitude.com. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm doing good. I'm excited about today's guest. It's not every day we get to talk to uh, former Marines. As you know, I was in the Navy, so... There's always a friendly rivalry there, so can't wait to pick on that a little bit. <laughs> you, you are friends with the Marines? I, I thought it was like the same branch. Is that not true? Uh, yes. If you look at the paycheck that they receive, it does say Department of Navy. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> We are joined today not only f- by a Marine, but a chartered financial analyst, uh, Joseph Hogue. How are you doing today, Joseph? I'm doing great, Dan, Kyle. Good to, uh, good to be here. And yes, I love my, uh, my swabby, swabby shipmates. <laughs> you say shipmates? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I said and what I was thinking might be two uh, entirely different things. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> no, actually, you know, I, I actually looking back, kind of, uh, kind of should have gone the Navy route. Actually, might have learned something I could, I could use here in the real world rather than uh, shooting and shooting and grunting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what I, how much of what I learned was actually useful, unless I actually wanted to go run a nuclear power plant, which I really did not. <laughs> Model your life after Homer Simpson. I know, right? Yeah, there's a lot of those jokes. <laughs> I was actually a bubblehead too, so we didn't get a whole lot of interaction with you guys. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We uh, I, I went on one med float, so that was pretty much the uh, the extent of my interaction. I actually had probably more interaction with uh, with the army guys there in uh, in Aberdeen hmm. uh, with the uh, MOS school. Uh, yeah, and, and learned that yeah, it's it's not the uh, the the Navy or Marines that have it best. It's it's definitely the Army and the Air Force with their bases. Air Force. Do you know why? Somebody explained this to me a while ago. Uh, when the like when the Navy builds a base, like they start out with like some really nice piers, then they get like you know the the dry docks and and all the facilities for taking care of the boats, and then they run out of money, and they still haven't built the barracks or the entertainment centers or any of the the stuff for like supporting the living staff. But the Air Force does it the other way around. They build all that shit first, and then when they had mo- they run out of money, they still have to build a runway. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Smart. Right, <laughs> they got the golf oh. courses in. Yeah, wow. Well, all right, should we actually talk about some investing now? Now that we know where you come from before you got to investing, yeah. Uh, why don't you share with us a little bit about how you got started your journey from marine to s- chartered financial analyst? Sure, sure. Well, I uh, you know after college uh, got into commercial real estate as an analyst there. Uh, and you know, not not so much the the real estate side, but just fell in love with the investing side, right? Uh, mm. You know, being able to being able to watch your money grow and and understand how that works. Uh, so I started uh, you know started learning, started getting a little bit more involved in in the investment process. I started investing myself uh, back in the Marine Corps in 1999, which of course was the uh, the best time to start start investing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, because we all know what happened after that. But uh, but yeah, just started getting more involved. Started taking uh, freelance jobs where I could in investing. Actually, ended up joining a venture capital firm there in uh, or up there in Canada, hmm. and put together a sell side a sell side research department for them. So I worked for worked for three and a half years, running their sell side research department, basically just doing us analysis on different startup companies as well as stocks. 
to uh, to to engage people and bring an interest on their uh, their private deals. So what does that involve? Like what what's the what sort of research goes into the into that? Well, about half of half of the research we did uh, just on you know, larger blue chips stocks. So the larger, more popular stocks, really kind of uh, content marketing to bring people in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then then we would do the research on the private deals that came to the uh, came into the venture capital uh, arm of the business. Uh, I know the the owner of, of the firm was was big into cannabis and uh, you know mm-hmm. a, a lot of the the farms. The farming and, and things like that. Canada's quite a bit further along on the uh, you know the legalization and and that kind of thing versus the U.S. Yeah. So he was uh, he was putting together quite a few of those deals. Uh, so we we did research uh, cannabis farms as well as distribution uh, for that. Mm-hmm. We did research on a lot of just a lot of other startup deals that uh, that were brought to brought into the firm uh, to see if those would be good investments for for the firm and its clients. So you said that you also did uh, the research on blue chip stocks, but I'm guessing if you're a venture capital firm, I wouldn't expect you to be investing in those. Was that just to, to put out information so people can see how well you perform? It was. Well, it was just is mainly that that content marketing type. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, you know, putting that out there on the internet, trying to get people to to be get interested in the firm, uh, where we could we could then you know grab investors from that from that base. Okay. During that during that time, I did get a little bit more uh, involved in you know just equity and analysts equity analysis, and, and ended up from there moving on to private wealth management, where I was working with the bulge bracket banks and that kind of thing, doing you know pure equity analysis. And it's in that time that that I did go uh, study for my CFA designation and uh, and moved fully into equity analysis. When you do the uh, the the equity analysis, what sort of techniques do you use to analyze uh, particular stocks? Is it a mix of technical and fundamental, or do you lean on one more than the other? Oh, almost all fundamental. Ah. We we had guys, you know, we've got guys that work technical analysis, and general generally, you know, I mean, I, I use technical analysis myself, but only in a very limited capacity, uh, basically just to try to find you know buy and sell points, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, trying to trying to get our stock at a, a little bit better price price point than, than where it is currently. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's almost all fundamental. I was really a top-down analyst. So I would start with those larger macroeconomic forces, the longer term trends and those universal forces really, really driving one section of the economy uh, and then drill that down into uh, sectors, sectors and then industries uh, that I thought would be, would have those tailwinds, would benefit from those forces. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you know, obviously, you know, you're starting off, you're starting off with 5,000 plus stocks traded, uh, well, just in the US exchange and then um, many more globally, it's nearly impossible just to start with that number of stocks and, and pick, you know, pick good investments. Right. So I always thought uh, it's much easier to find those larger, lar- larger forces, those you know, demographic forces, those, those techno- technological trends, the things pushing everything in that industry over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, drilling that down, once you find the industries and the sectors that are benefiting from those trends, it becomes much easier to, to pick you know, good investments. Basically, uh, if you've got a, an industry benefiting from that long ten-year ter- trend, then uh, then you know all the stocks within that industry, or, or even the sector, are going to be benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. So, in the the end of the day, even if you don't pick the very best of the best company within that industry, you know you're still going to have that tailwind, and you're still going to make those positive returns. So, is there any uh, particular industry or sector that you're focused on for like the next? Five or ten years? Sure, sure. A couple of them, you know, just a couple of trends that I'm watching. Uh, the uh, the the self driving uh, on the commercial side, so autonomous vehicles on, on the commercial trucking side and transportation side, really interesting. They are just now getting to where, of course, they've been promising over the last uh, over the last five mm-hmm. years. Uh, right. They saying, hey, these things are ready. These things are going to be ready. Uh, but they're just actually are getting to the point where they have you know driverless trucks doing routes. Mm-hmm. You know, mostly mostly outside the cities, driverless trucks doing doing these routes. And if you look at trucking companies, yeah, upwards of a third of their operating expenses are those driver costs. And there's a massive driver shortage all across the U.S. So once these uh, once these things these uh, these autonomous uh, commercial trucks are yeah, are are really uh, viable and being used. I, I mean, you're going to see the profit margins for these for these transportation companies just skyrocket. Uh, so that's one thing. The one you know, one industry I'm looking at very c- closely: the healthcare industry. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, uh, a perfect example: Teladoc. Teladoc. 
Teladoc Health, perfect example of the uh, the, the whole pandemic crash. Uh, so the stock hasn't done well over the last year, but this is a company that just dominates in that virtual healthcare space. Uh, and, and a lot of what I do is, you know, looking looking at where where there are the uh, the gaps and the the giant uh, you know demand shortages in uh, in industries. And one industry we, where we see is there is a massive a massive shortage of nurses and, and really all healthcare professionals in an industry. Yep. So, you know, any, any technology or any advancement that, that can help relieve that shortage. Uh, and, and we're seeing that in obviously that virtual healthcare, being able to lower costs of uh, patient, patient healthcare services, uh, being able to lower the demand for, for different uh, staffing and that kind of thing. And, uh, and it's, it's just something that's only going to gr- gain momentum. I would agree with you 100% there with the uh, the demographics of the US population distribution as far as like the baby boomers pushing the you know higher and higher into that age bracket. Absolutely. I can't see healthcare becoming less important in the next yeah, right. you know 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean my wife uh, we're we're actually just getting ready to move to Tampa and uh, looking at looking at salaries for for my wife she's a nurse and they're they're doing sixty five seventy thousand dollars a year and that's just base without overtime mm-hmm. uh so so yeah you know i mean anything that uh, can help decrease those those healthcare costs as well as make the make the staffing shortages easier mm-hmm. uh it, it's definitely a trend that we're going to see evolving uh so so that's definitely one um and a lot of times when I'm looking at these trends, then I'll either look at uh, you know a few stocks in the sector to invest. Uh, if the if that trend is going to affect really largely the entire sector, something like transportation and the self driving tr- trucks, or if there is just one definable a- and obvious leader within the space, something like like Teladoc with with that virtualization of healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that the, in that case, I would go with that one single stock uh, rather than maybe two or three within the space. So when you're doing that kind of fun fundamental analysis, how do you know which information to trust? Like if there's no obvious leader and you're looking at several different companies, obviously each of those companies is going to claim that they're on track to be the leader. Like how, what are some things you can do to, to get information that's better than just, uh, you know, like a random article on some pump and dump website? Sure, sure. Well, I think two of the best, uh, two of the best sources, or two of the best points you really you want to look at is the sales growth and then the operating margin mm-hmm. uh, of each company within that space. Okay, so sales growth, obviously, uh, you know, faster sales growth, higher sales growth than its peers or its competitors is one. It's going to you know just flow through into uh, into earnings and stock price eventually, uh, but also it can usually be an indication of uh, some kind of a competitive advantage, right? If mm. if you know, out of five stocks within the industry, if if uh, the average growth after average growth in sales for you know four of them is you know we'll say ten percent, but one company is growing sales by twenty percent a year uh, in its comparable size and all that, then obviously there's something there. Something is there that that this company is taking market share or, or taking you know growing sales faster than these other companies. So a lot of times that's it's kind of a an easy quantitative way to find a qualitative. Uh, idea like that competitive advantage because really that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those qualitative, uh, you know, ideas. Uh, but it's so hard to you know, know what those are. Uh, the <laughs> other, the other thing is the uh, the operating margin, right? Which is just, of course, the the operating income uh, divided by total sales, which mm-hmm. is uh, you know your total sales minus your uh, your cost of goods, so production costs, uh, supply costs, things like that, minus operating costs, which are, are going to be your, your marketing, research and development, staffing, uh, a lot the uh, the operating costs there. All that information should be on the balance sheet too, right? The uh, when that, the company reports their earnings. That's the income statement. Income statement always starts with the revenue, uh, then it minuses out their their uh, cost of sales, right? Which is again their, their production costs, uh, you know, some some supply costs, that kind of thing, and then it goes into minus out operating costs, right? Which is just mm-hmm. what it sounds like. All the costs that it, it takes to you know, operate and run that, that company, which marketing, staffing, um, things like that, research and development. And then what you have left over is that operating income. So that is the income, the, the income uh, you know, generated by operating that company. That divided by the total sales is the operating margin or operating profitability. And it's really, it's just a great, uh, a great measure of management's ability to turn sales into profits, into those mm-hmm. operational profits, right? So one, you know, obviously you want to see a, a high operating margin because you know, that's ultimately... Uh, before you know, before uh, taxes and some other costs, that's ultimately the profit to investors. But more importantly, again, is that comparing 
that profitability or that margin, that percentage against competitors in the space can really show you a, a good quantitative idea of for, for some of those qualitative factors, right? Uh, one mm-hmm. of the most important things when you're analyzing a stock is, is what's the quality of management? Well, you know, how, who knows? How, how do you measure quality of management? Well, by uh, CEO pay, obviously. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must be, you must be you must be earning that paycheck somehow, right? Right. Um, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, I mean, if it's it's the the management that is able to generate those uh, those higher that those higher percentages, those those margins. So yeah, if again, you know, if four four out of the five companies are generating an operating profitability or operating margin of of twenty percent, and then you've got one company here that's sitting at thirty or thirty five percent. Then uh, obviously there is something there, right? So uh, of course you, you need to dig in a little bit deeper and see, okay, you know, where are the costs lower for this for one company versus the others, and, and make sure that that's kind of a durable, uh, a durable advantage, something that they're able to 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 use over time. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, it's it's you know surprisingly easy to to just you know find some of these a few points that you can look to and, and really point to as, hey, this company has some kind of a competitive advantage over its um you know over its over its competition uh i noticed that you have a stock market blog uh www.mystockmarketbasics.com uh, we'll put the link in the description for everybody but do you have anything on there that kind of covers like how to read a balance sheet or how to interpret those income statements uh, you know i don't I, I don't know if i do i usually usually i transcript my videos and then i'll put the video transcripts on there and i do have three videos that cover each of the financial statements. So Okay, so on your YouTube channel would be the better place to check? It's definitely going to be on there. I can actually send you uh, links directly to those videos if, if you like. But uh, but on the uh, on the blog, I try to keep it actually a little bit more basic, mm-hmm. hence the name, My Stock Market Basics. I'm really trying to uncomplicate investing, uh, for especially for new investors. Uh, really trying to get back to the basics that, okay, you know what? These are these are the basic terms you need. This is how to get started investing and, uh, and how to be successful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so so I try to try to really make it as as painless as possible because you know compound interest the the eighth the eighth wonder of the world and uh, and it's how how people make money. Uh, I'm looking at one of the top ones you have on here. The three ways the stock market is rigged against you. Ah, yes, <laughs> can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, just uh, actually, you know, not not above a little sensationalism. Uh, yeah, we all are, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but there are, you know, there are things that I saw as a venture capital analyst, as private wealth management, right, working for the uh, the bulge bracket banks, and that 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 you know aren't necessarily uh, public knowledge, and ways that uh, unfortunately there are ways that a lot of people kind of get around the system, uh, not not necessarily always breaking the law, but definitely bending it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one particular example is just insider trading, and how how easy it is actually to get around that law. Um, the uh, the actual the actual law says that you can trade on the, what you think or what you know is is insider information as long as you don't know the source of that information was somebody on the inside right so the, the example in that the example in that post is uh, you know Phil Phil Mickel, Mickelson the, uh, the the golfer yeah great golfer I'm sure a great person but he got a stock tip from. A Las Vegas bookie, right? A uh, you know, a businessman. He said calls himself, right? <laughs> who, who Mickelson just happened to owe uh, quite a bit of money to. <laughs> this businessman happened to know the uh, the chairman of Dean Foods, right? And uh, which subsequently also owed this businessman money. Uh huh. You know, so you kind of follow the money there. <laughs> <laughs> so the chairman of Dean Foods passed on a, a hot tip that uh, you know the company was, uh, and I forget which one, I think they were going to be they're going to make a big deal or, or be acquired or something. Uh, passed along the tip to to the businessman, the Las Vegas businessman, and uh, and the Las Vegas businessman passed that tip on to Mickelson. Uh, well, Mickelson business, the businessman and Mickelson both bought a bunch of Dean shares, uh, made a few million dollars in the process. Uh, and in court, it was actually, you know, it came out in court, uh, that the businessman was obviously guilty of insider trading because Mm -hmm. the chairman of Dean foods probably knew some pretty good information. Mickelson got off though, because he, uh, he could claim anyway that he didn't know 
where this information was coming from. Mm-hmm. He just got you know, took, got a tip from a friend uh, who had no connection with Dean Foods whatsoever. Right. So, uh, so he actually got off on it, and uh, I mean, I think he I think he ended up you know giving some of the money back into charity or something like that just to you know just to look good. Does it count as charity to pay your debts, <laughs> your gambling debts? <laughs> but it, it is. Uh, yeah, it is surprising. Hey, Davis's legal defense is what he was mm-hmm. doing. <laughs> It is surprising how uh, how how easy uh, and, and how frequently something like that happens. You know where where information is passed around, and as long as you can kind of conceal the uh, the source of the information, then uh, then you can make a lot of money and uh, with virtually no no legal costs. One of the ones that we always are leery of is listening to to analyst recommendations. Anytime you see somebody promoting a stock, like we're always wondering what the incentive is on that. Is that something that maybe you might have seen in the past that you? You can comment oh, sure. on, or sure. I mean, that's everywhere. That's uh, that's so so. You, and you've you've actually got two. You've actually got two problems. Two different problems here. Uh, one, you know, the 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 large the large bank analysts, uh, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. any any bank analyst like that, they're going to the 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 recommendations on those are are. Uh, unanimous, almost unanimously skewed to the the positive side, right? Mm-hmm. You'll see most analysts they'll they'll cover a stock if it's a buy or if it's at least you know a stronghold or something like that. Uh, but then all of a sudden they'll drop coverage, and that's just because you know maybe their their opinion, their legitimate opinion of the stock has gone down, uh, but they don't want to say that because. Of course, then the bank loses the uh, the company as a as an investment banking client. Uh huh. So so that happens all the time. Oh, that's interesting. And these banks they they make most of their money off of uh, investment banking. So you know, selling companies bonds, uh, arranging those, uh, arranging you know, deals, mergers and acquisition deals. So they definitely don't want to piss off their 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 customers with some you know some piss anti analyst saying, "Hey, I would be worried about Tesla over the next nine months." Uh, so they just don't do it. <laughs> right. You just see that the an- analysis just dropped and just disappeared for a couple. Well, that almost sounds like more of a that would be something I think you should be watching for. Then, if you can't trust their actual analysis when they stop talking about a company, that seems like that's more of a <laughs> a flag than anything else. Yeah. It is, is. It is a definite. It definitely is a big clue. Uh, another one. Uh, one you see a little more often on the so the influencer side on YouTube on blogs things like that yep. is just paid coverage. Right. Uh, is is a lot of obviously the smaller companies. You know, companies uh, are just a few hundred million dollar hundred million dollars size. They're not going to be covered by J.P. Morgan. Uh, the analysts mm-hmm. at you know Goldman Sachs couldn't care less what you know gold gold spelunking Inc. is doing up there in Canada or whatever. Right. So it, it is a legitimate practice to to really pay for coverage. Right. You 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 contact analysts, uh, smaller investment firm analysts, or just influencers. You ask, hey, you, you know, would you would you cover our stock and take a look at it? And that's not really where the problem comes in. The problem comes in is you know if the analyst kind of changes their opinion, right, or or just writes some kind of a, a, you know overflowing, glowing co- commentary on this stock, uh, and then doesn't disclose that it is you know it is a paid paid sponsorship by the company. Right. We we took some we took some sponsorships. Uh, maybe was that a year ago, Dan? Yeah. But we were very very clear that they were paid. I think we yeah. even wrote our own theme song. Yeah. <laughs> for it. <laughs> Yeah, Saved by the Bell. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and really, there's there's uh, two things I would wa- I would watch for two things in that. One is obviously, yeah, you look, you know, you, you look in the description or or in the notes or, or anything to see if it is a sponsorship and and kind of take that with a grain of salt, right? Even if it is a sponsorship, mm-hmm. like I said, you know, if it sounds like fair and on fair and honest uh, analysis, or you, you can at least take the factual statements uh, as analysis. Right, you can do that, uh, but also you, you need to look at a stock, and you know, I mean, if it's if it's one of these stocks, I won't even cut. Co- I've turned down a lot of them that are, you know, a hundred less than a hundred million market cap or less than you know penny stocks, right? Less than a dollar trading, uh, maybe mm-hmm. less than less than I would say twenty thousand shares traded daily, uh, because the problem with a lot of those is it is so easy to move the market on those. Right, that, you know, if you get if you get a relatively large podcast or a YouTube channel or something promoting a stock saying, you know, saying it's a great, a great investment, uh, then you can, you can really move the market uh, on that. So what'll mm-hmm. happen, obviously, you know, you'll get, you'll get bad faith actors, uh, you know, firms or, or basically just chop shops, um, you know, the boiler rooms, the old, the old bo- boiler rooms come online. It's the old Jordan Belfort thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, they will, uh, they'll pay a, they'll pay a, a YouTuber or, or, you know, somebody to, 
you know, they'll pay them a thousand dollars to to pump the stock. Uh, where you know they're they're obviously buying twenty or thirty or fifty thousand dollars worth of shares before that, uh, and then just going to pump and dump the stock. Right. Uh, so yeah, if you're you know you see you see these this quote unquote analysis of stocks, these extremely small cap, cap stocks, uh, you really need to be wary of that. If the stock price has gone up considerably in the days before that analysis came out. So that video, you know, whether, whether, whether you're seeing it right as it publishes or not, you know, look at the stock mm-hmm. price before that video came out. And if it went up quite a bit, then you probably be a pretty good indication of some kind of pump and dump. Right. Oh, that's good. More good information. Yeah. And that's not, and that's not necessarily the, to say that the, the influencer is, is in on anything like that. A, a lot of times the influencer is just, no, it's just trying to make they're, money. <laughs> they're just trying to, they're just trying yeah. to get some work and uh, you know, they're not buying or selling the shares themselves. Uh, it's, it's these, you know, it's these boiler room shops that are contracting out that, that are secretly buying these shares beforehand. I think we turned down, I can't count the number of ones that I said no to because I and I looked at their income statements. The majority of their income was coming from issuing new shares. Yeah, new but, shares. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not talking about this company. Well, that's always a, a healthy business model, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's called a pyramid scheme, I think. <laughs> I see you used to write for Motley Fool. Speaking of analyst stuff, I did. <laughs> oh, did analyst, you? Was that analyst in quotation marks or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you're the one who told me to buy Salesforce, then I, I'd yeah. say you're okay. Then I hear a rhetorical question coming up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I'm actually interested because we, we we talk about the Motley Fool. They're they're like a, a big guy on the block, right? People know the Motley Fool. I'm actually interested in how that relationship came together, what it was like, and what caused you to move on. Oh wow! So that was that was quite a while ago. I mean, I do have actually, you know, I will say I do have a like a, a free report that I put together. Uh, I give it away as kind of a an affiliate thing on the uh, on the video in the videos mm-hmm. and on the blog. Uh, basically, you know, the the five I think it's the five stocks that are the largest stocks in my portfolio. Uh, so I do I still do that, and uh, you know, of course, people sign up. The Motley Fool sends them those those teaser emails trying to get them to sign up. Yeah, but but on my end, it's it's you know free, no obligation report. So I think. It was a great way to uh, to support the channel and that kind of thing. But uh, that the the actual writing, I think that was probably what 2013, 2014. That was right just when I was just getting started, just getting started uh, transitioning into that uh, that equity an- analyst role. Mm-hmm. Actually, wrote for them, wrote for uh, Seeking Alpha, you know, quite a bit. They were doing their thing there, uh, and, and yeah, you know, just just looking to uh, expand, you know, my portfolio of of equity analysis and get to get into content a little bit more. I was just starting the blogs as well. So I was just starting to learn how to really write for the internet. Um, so I think, I think with Motley Fool, I mean, I think Motley Fool was, uh, I think they contacted me cause I, cause I was working on seeking alpha for quite a while before that. And then Motley Fool reached out uh, through email. And, oh, they poached you. Yep. Yeah, they did. Uh, and I think I worked for them. I think I, I wrote probably maybe an article a week or, or so, maybe a couple, a few, a few a month for about a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's, there comes a point where you're just, you're just doing so well and, and you want to focus on your own business, your own assets that you kind of start dropping the freelance clients. And, and I think Motley Fool mm-hmm. was one of the lower paying freelance client clients as far as equity analysis. I think they're, they're mostly paying for uh, content and, and just journalist mm-hmm. kind of stuff rather than strong, you know, strong in-depth analysis. So obviously the, the rates are going to be a little bit lower. I don't know what they're paying now. I, I want to go back a little bit to your, you, you mentioned that the serving in the Marine Corps and wishing that you maybe had done a different branch to, to try to get more, better prepared for, for life after the military. But I know that was kind of said in jest, but uh, there's got to be some takeaways or some ways that, that the service helped you. Like what, oh, what, what do you find like being like the, the strongest benefits of that? Oh, it helped me grow up helped me grow up immensely. You know, I, I mean, I, I actually, I, I did a year and a half, year and a half of college before going into the Marine Corps. And, you know, I, I mean, and this is probably something I shouldn't say as a, uh, as a financial analyst and a financial, you know, quote unquote guru, but I fl- I almost flunked out of, uh, you know, f- uh, corporate finance 101 my first year of college. Um, I think I, I think I had like a D and that was a low D. I mean, we're talking, we're talking edge right there. Um, so, you know, I just, I was, I, I just wasn't going to classes and I just wasn't ready for that kind of independence or that responsibility. Uh, so, so, and then, you know, yeah, yeah. Got out of the Marine Corps, went back to college and, um, I was, you know, 3.8, 3.9, 
uh, grade point average student doing, I did two majors, finance and communication studies. So it, just the, the change in responsibility, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. And it helps to start going to classes. So that's, I think that's, that's <laughs> one thing. You know, being, being able to get up, I, I guess, you know, having to get up at, at four in the morning for guard duty in the Marine Corps kind of helps being able to get up at 9.30 in the morning for classes. <laughs> okay. uh, so that that's changes. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, just that, that level of responsibility. It, it also helped me with the level of confidence, right? Mm-hmm. Really, kind of, kind of all the cliches you always hear about about the military, uh, but they are true. Uh, they are, you know, there's a, a a grain of truth in, in all of them. Uh, you know, they give you that that pride, that confidence, and uh, and you know, frankly, honestly, I think I think we should have mandatory service of, of two years for everyone out of high school. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just help people grow up a little bit, help them, you know, instill some kind of service to the community, and, and, and you know, and they're they're get them into something larger than themselves before you, know, you put them behind a, the wheel, but put them behind a wheel and, uh, you know, basically tell them, Hey, get a life. Right. It sounds like the theme to starship troopers. <laughs> exactly. I can't say I disagree a hundred percent, but <laughs> no, I think it would solve that uh, student debt problem. There you go. Yeah. I- Plus we can get rid of all the goddamn bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish I had a quote from that movie. Uh, so many, so many good ones. <laughs> My favorite was the Mormons being slaughtered at the end uh, because they refused <laughs> to leave the planet. Because <laughs> uh, they knew no Mormon was going to watch that. My favorite, I guess, was just Denise Richards. But uh, you know, that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that's that's what I remember. <laughs> I remember that. Too. <laughs> yeah, there were there weren't any co-ed shower scenes in uh, when I was in the Marine Corps. Unfortunately, there were no women on subs when I was in. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, there's the, it's just the, the monetary benefits, uh, you know, they pay, they pay, don't pay you much in the Marine Corps or in any, any of the service branches, uh, honestly. It's mostly tax free. Yeah, but everything's paid for, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you, I was making all of, I think, $800 a month uh, there towards the end as a corporal uh, and banking most of it. Right. Right. Uh, you know, so, so you've got that, you've got the, the, the GI bill, which I think is called something different now, but same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess now I was talking to a, uh, another podcaster just getting out of the Navy. And I guess now they've got where you can actually get like end of orders or, or something like that, like three years or three months or something. He's actually basically has orders to be at a real estate uh, company working there for the last three months of his tour. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. He is actually working at a real estate company as a real estate agent, licensed real estate agent for the last three months of his, uh, of his enlistment. Uh, and oh, that's where was that when I was getting out. Exactly. All right. So we will have a recruitment link in this episode description. <laughs> if know, you right? want to join the military, <laughs> we'll make sure it's the air force link. <laughs> <laughs> is this, is, do you get some kind of an affiliate bonus from, uh, from the, 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 the military? That'd be awesome. No, I just, I served. So I've always been a fan of, I mean, I didn't enjoy my time in, obviously I didn't do the full 20, but I mean, I'm very grateful for, for what, benefits i got out of it and i'm always curious to hear what other people say because i've talked to a lot of marines that that feel like that uh, there's marine service has ill prepared them for anything other than like being a police officer or security guard and i just don't think that's true i think there's plenty of other benefits to it no well they they, i mean it's easy to overlook the uh the the intrinsic kind of rewards i guess uh, and the change to your character uh, mm-hmm. which, which I think with, with the Marine Corps, that's, that's probably the, the biggest part of it. You know, I mean, you're not learning, you're not learning a lot of the, uh, the, the hard skills and the, I wouldn't, I won't say skills, but the, the hard job, you know, the, the, the detailed jobs that you get in right. a lot of, the, you know, mechanic uh, and that kind of thing. Let's see, that says that you've also been on Bloomberg and CNBC. What were you doing there? Uh, there's just a, as an analyst, you know, uh, working as a role in analyst. Uh, one of my first, actually, one of my first con- conferences was with Bloomberg. Uh, invited in 2012, uh, I believe it was, invited to, to New York to speak at a conference on uh, market integration in Latin America. I'd just written a report uh is uh, the the markets uh, Chile, Chile, Colombia, and Peru were coming together in some kind of a market integration there. Hmm. And so I was really you know talking about that, talking about the opportunities uh, in Latin America as far as investment and that kind of thing. So I, I spoke on a on a panel there. The other ones were were you know your your traditional equity analyst roles where where somebody comes on and say hey you know I like stock X Y and Z here's why right uh, so it's a little bit li- less limited capacity. Have you been following um, El Salvador and their 
adoption of Bitcoin. Uh, that's it. Yeah, that's that's just that's, that's frustrating, right? Because you know, I, I mean, it's <laughs> it's interesting that that they went that route and and you know, they went out on the ledge and tried it. I, I think obviously is a little bit more mm-hmm. of you know a cult personality there involved. But uh, but uh, you know, I, I mean, especially any country that ha- gets like what is it like something like a third or a fifth of their economy from from remittances, mm-hmm. uh, and, and when you know you have something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency that can slash cost for remittances in half, then uh, it's not a, it's not as dumb as it as it sounds, right? Uh, but it's okay, too bad. That makes more sense. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, you know, the just the 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 idea of not necessarily their official currency, but the idea of integrating. It and getting it more used among the people because because yeah it is it is a huge part of their economy as those remittances from from overseas uh, and crypto is you know, obviously it's, it's instantaneous it's it's much lower cost than uh, than you know going through MoneyGram or some of these um, so it was a good idea it's just I, I think it was you know ill timed and yeah. and, and you know, unfortunate because. And then you get uh, you get a lot of the, the traditional uh, the, the IMF right the the IMF and, and some of these other world banks. That is a real group, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it sounds it's, like a George it's, Costanza it's, charity. It, it's not the Illuminati, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, okay, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the Illuminati, yeah. and all the all the powers that be. I guess I uh, really <laughs> I, I really been leaning on them, right? Withholding uh, you know withholding aid and and money just because they have gone so aggressive. Uh, into Bitcoin, <laughs> so it's, it's unfortunate. It's an un- unfortunate that now crypto has collapsed so much that it is, you know, quote unquote, proving how bad how bad the uh, the move was. Yeah, but crypto's always done that, and it has. You know, I, I think what is it? It's down something like seventy percent now. It was down eighty five percent after the two thousand seventeen boom. Right. Uh, so it's right around you know where hopefully hopefully it'll be a bottom. There's intrinsic value there. I, I don't think it's going away. You know, some of these. Poo coins, I guess they're called, uh, have have no real use or u- utility or anything. But uh, you, you look at the larger coins like uh, Ether uh, and uh, or Ethereum and Bitcoin. I mean, they are built on verification of, of that you know those changes in the blockchain, uh, which mm-hmm. are being used across all different industries right now. Really revolutionizing records management and a lot of other industries. Uh, so they're, they've got some real utility in them. It's just too much speculation. Is that what you would say is the intrinsic value in in crypto is the blockchain and the possibility of of ledger systems? I would. I would. Because, you know, even in so even in the proof of stake model where uh, you're not necessarily uh, rewarding miners with uh, the the changes, the verifications. I mean, you still need some kind of uh, some kind of verification of each change in that blockchain. And uh, and again, yeah, that blockchain, that blockchain technology. I mean, it, as a decentralized way of records management, um, many many other uses that I am not smart enough to to talk about. Uh, but it, it is revolutionizing a lot of industries and, and the way a lot of industries work with their data management. Uh, so it is necessary, uh, and you know, within that, so the gas behind that engine is are the tokens. You you have to either put the tokens up for stake. For those changes, or you have to uh, reward the miners that are verifying those those changes on the on the technology. Uh, so there is definitely intrinsic value on these. Um, besides that, with especially with Ethereum, with this decentralized finance, uh, a lot of the smart contracts being built on those blockchains, you know, those work uh, it, really in the same way, using the tokens mm-hmm. for, for verification and for you know changes in those contracts. So it is, uh, especially in real estate, you know, real estate is another good example where uh, these smart contracts on the blockchain are just so much faster. They're so much more, uh, you know, they're, they're safer uh, and more secure as well as less costly than that traditional model of, you know, closing on a, a real estate transaction or something. So what do you think is the next step for cryptocurrency in order to, to fully be embraced by the world? It's a time, I think, you know, time, time and demographic changes. Uh, I think if you look at adoption just by de- demography, then uh, all the old timers out there, the, uh, I think, who, who was it that called them a uh, financial geriatrics? Uh, Peter oh, Thiel. Oh, God. I think yeah, Peter, yeah, Thiel, yeah. <laughs> Peter Thiel talking about Warren Buffett and yep. some of the, you know, uh, those calling them financial geriatrics, uh, a little pointed and a little barbed, but uh, not completely untrue. You know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the older generations that, don't understand that blockchain technology. Don't understand how it's being used and and the utility value behind the coins. Um, you know, just really, just not not even giving it a chance. Uh, mm-hmm. Where you look at that versus the Gen Z, the the millennials that are uh, m- many of them very much invested and very much uh, more 
uh, accepting of uh, of uh, the the technology and that. I don't think they understand it either, though. To be no, honest, not so, not so much. I, I mean, mostly, <laughs> mostly, it is it is that speculation. Yeah, I don't um, think Warren Buffett understands how electricity works either, though. But that doesn't stop him from making use of it, making a lot of money. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, you know, so so time is one thing, uh, and just you know, greater. Uh, I, I think more adoption. I mean, basically, one of the one of the other values uh, within cryptocurrency is that network effect. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. based on uh, what is it? And I want to say Moore's law, but that's that's semiconductors. Uh, there, there's a, yeah. a law a, a law of mathematics that says you can you can value something based off of its uh, network, right? And it's been surprisingly huh. uh, surprisingly accurate when uh, analyzing social media stocks, right? Because those are in basically intrinsically valued off of their their networks and uh, their network growth. Metcalf's law. It's Metcalf's law. It's you know a mathematical equation to to really value something based on its network. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, so there is there is some some real intrinsic value. Based on that network adoption, the network growth. I didn't realize DK Metcalf was uh, a mathematician too. I thought he just caught the ball for the Seahawks. Yeah, right over my head. <laughs> not a football fan. <laughs> Mine too. Don't don't feel bad. Oh, right. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I love baseball. Come on. <laughs> yeah, he scored a goal unit. But, but yeah, you know there 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 is there is intrinsic value, and and just so yeah. adoption just takes time. I, I you know you've got you've got companies like Fidelity that are rolling out. Uh, you know, crypto holdings for 401k, which is yep. yeah, a multi-trillion dollar market. Of course, there's there's many that are trying to fight them in that, but there's there 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 are there's enough support, and more importantly, there's enough enough lobbyists uh, pushing you know pushing for this adoption, <laughs> uh, pushing for this that uh, the industry the industry will survive. Are you paying attention to the uh, the legislation that's been introduced, uh, Dan? I think you brought that up last uh, episode. Sure, uh, paying you know paying attention to the uh, the headline, but not so much not so much though it's in there. It, it is in no way anything close to what what will actually be in the bill. Well, of uh, course, yeah. But just but just in the terms of there are supporters there in you know there in Congress uh, that are you know that are fighting as at least at least a balance in the industry versus uh, some of the other Congress people that are you know those those fi- those financial geriatrics that we all that we <laughs> right. <all. laughs> I was just curious if you agreed with the definition that they came up with. Like, how do you classify cryptocurrency? Yeah, you know, I would actually probably say most of it is going to be uh, some kind of a security. Uh, I mean, especially outside of outside of Bitcoin, I, I, it's hard to say for Bitcoin and Ethereum because because I do think it has that utilitarian value. Mm-hmm. Uh, but outside of that, I, I mean, it is mostly a security, right? And sold as a security. Uh, so, so probably should be regulated by the SEC. Uh, and I've got no problems with that. If mm-hmm. the SEC would just get off its ass and, and, you know, set up some regulations, right. You know, chair, uh, chair Ginsburg or chair, uh, Gary Gensler. Gensler. Yeah. I almost said yep. Gensler. He's the oh. uh, hus- hus- <laughs> husband of the late, uh, you know, s- uh, Supreme court justice. Supreme, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, Gensler, you know, he, he, he continuously comes out and rails against, uh, big uh, cryptocurrencies and the firms mm-hmm. but, and saying that they're breaking the rules. Well, there are no rules. He hasn't, and he's yeah. the guy that's supposed to be setting these up. And, uh, and it's just kind of a, a gross negligence. There's actually a chair on the board there at the SEC and her, her name escapes me, but she's actually been surprisingly uh, honest and truthful that uh, she disagrees with the, uh, the rest of the board and the SEC uh, quite often that hmm. this enforcement, this, this, uh, this trend of enforcement rather than regulation is not what the SEC was set up to do. Basically, the SEC is is making bank. They are making you well know, hundred a hundred million dollars in the case of BlockFi uh, by not writing the rules and instead you know going you know going up and filing in court that uh, these you know these crypto firms are breaking those rules the the, right. the non rules and and then suing them. So you yep. know, Block, BlockFi had to pay BlockFi had to pay hundred million dollars uh, to settle that case, uh, and then of course you know the hundred the millions of dollars on on all the other cases that the the, the SEC is bringing against uh, firms because it's there there's no rules so you know they can basically say they're breaking anything so it's it's really too bad that that the government you know that the the SEC where it could really support and and foster you know investor protection and that if it made some rules uh, that that it's basically just going after the money. Right. Do you think they'll go after Matt Damon next? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matt Damon and Kardashian, and they're all going to—they're all going to be in orange jumpsuits pretty soon. 
<laughs> Wait, just a minute. Just a minute. They're rich. No, they won't. <laughs> yeah, no, they won't go anywhere. <laughs> let's be honest. It's true. Oh, uh, let's see. We're getting towards the end here. So before that happens, Dan, I think we should ask about the state of the economy now and where. Uh, let's see. I think you, one of your most recent posts was about the stock market cycle and uh, when stocks will stop falling. Well, you know, you know I mean, I, I think most of all, I, I think investors just need to need to change their perception or their perspective on this. I, mm-hmm. I see so many investors just get so excited about stocks as the market is going up. Right? They push every every dime they uh, they have into you know the the last stock their their Uber tri- driver told them about. Uh, because you know everybody's mm-hmm. getting rich, right? Yeah, and uh, and then get panicked and sell out of their stocks as prices come down. And, and it should be just the opposite, right? It's counterintuitive, but uh, you know this is the only time you know you're getting a discount on stocks. Uh, you you what? Look at any stock chart over the last fifty years, and the only one rule, the the one guarantee is that stocks do eventually rebound and go higher. Uh, so now you you know you're getting discounts on those prices. So it is a great time to invest. I think the average uh, the average return over the next five years after the S and P hits that twenty percent down from its peak, so actually hits that bear market. Investors that started investing at that point made an average of seventy percent over the next five years, which is like an eleven percent annualized return. Uh, you know, it's 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 to, it does need to be just a change in perception. I, I think. Yeah, you know, obviously nobody knows where where the market comes down. Uh, it's already down twenty percent. I think the average. The average bear market crash over the last twelve cycles, which is like back down back to nineteen fifty six, I think, mm-hmm. uh, is is you know twenty eight percent down from the peak. It's lasted you know nine nine to twelve months. So you know there there could still be further further room to to fall. Uh, the the Fed has just started hiking interest rates, uh, but you know I, I think if investors just you know, kind of take a formalized approach, basically write down, okay, you know, if the, if the S&P 500 or if the stock market falls to this point, I'm going to invest a third of my cash, right? Or a third of mm-hmm. whatever I have st- set aside. If it goes down a little bit further, I'm going to invest another third. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, a little bit further, uh, then invest uh, a little bit more. So, you know, if, if we say something like 3,400, right? So the S&P hit today, something like 3,650, it's about 24% down from its peak. Uh, if the S&P 500 hits 3,400, it's about 30, 30% down, then invest something. Okay. If it falls mm-hmm. further, uh, you know, 40% down or so, 2,900, I'm going to invest another third of my cash, right? And th- further down to 26%, uh, I'm going to invest the rest, right? I think what that does is one, it gets your money working for you, right? You're not sitting there waiting for stocks to fall further. Uh, you, so you've got some money working for you back in stocks when that market does eventually rebound and and um, you know you can you can participate in that, but you're also saving some money aside just in case it gets worse. Uh, so you get kind of the best of both worlds there. More importantly, though, it just saves people from looking at the stock market every day, wondering when to invest. Is this the bottom? Should I should I go all in? That kind of thing, and really just you know tearing their hair out trying to do that kind of market timing. And it takes mm-hmm. the guess really takes the guesswork out of out of investing uh, it makes sure that yes you have you have some money set aside but it also makes sure that you're getting back in stocks and, and taking advantage of again what is really the best time to invest you know the, the best analogy i always like using is uh amazon after the dot-com bust um uh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. ipo ipo in 97 reached something like a hundred dollars a share in 99 fell down it fell 95 percent under under six dollars a share by 2001 Ninety-five um, percent. So, of course, everybody's looking at it as they've looked at, you know, Teladoc and SoFi and all these other stocks lately, and saying, "Hey, no way! That is a horrible investment." Uh, it's the worst chart mm-hmm. I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, it's the worst. It's the worst stock out there. Uh, and yeah. of course, you know, the people that looked at the company saw that, yeah, maybe it's not a growth stock, but it is still a growth company. It is still posting 30 percent sales growth a year. Uh, still changing the world in which we live in. I'm going to invest in it. I'm going to buy more shares. Uh, those people have, you know, have have made like a fifty thousand percent return over. Uh, I mean, to to last year, it's fallen a little bit since last year, but you know, to to the thirty five hundred dollar peak last year, uh, that would have turned a thousand dollars into half a million dollars. One investment, just yep. by not panicking out of the market, looking rationally, looking dispassionately at stocks, and and finding those leaders that that you know are going to be around for the next ten or twenty years. One other thing I wanted to ask you about with the current market conditions that we're seeing now. Um, with the Fed trying to reduce liquidity uh, or reduce the balance sheet, no longer pumping liquidity into the markets like they've been sure. doing since the 2008 crash, do you see that as being 
different than typical bear markets or or do you does that not concern you at all sure well that's i mean that's that's really the big question is whether this is just a cyclical a typical bear market that lasts you know on average 9 to 12 months or if it's something the start of something like a secular bear market which can last you know 10 years right uh, if you look at a stock chart i mean you'll you'll notice those periods from uh, you know, all the way from like 19, I think 1994 to 2013, uh, where mm-hmm. stocks, you know, yes, stocks went up and down within that, but within that, that whole 10, 15 year period, stocks really went nowhere. Uh, it happened again in the, like the seventies, right? We had a secular bear market where stocks went nowhere over a good 10, 15 years. Uh, so that's really the, the, the question you, you want to watch out for. And, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we're still in kind of a secular bull market with really those technological drivers pushing, uh, you know, pushing pushing advances in the economy and pushing uh, corporate earnings and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is. I mean, it is undoubtedly uh, a new new territory for the Fed. I mean, at no point have we had such high inflation, such low, uh, you know, unemployment, uh, and and the need to back out so much stimulus. You know, I mean, the mm-hmm. Fed balance sheet at nine trillion dollars. Uh, the, yeah. the, the federal government having pumped so much money just over the last couple of years, um, so they definitely need to bring you know bring things uh, bring bring inflation down and, and pr- pull back on their balance sheet. I don't see the political will one the political will to uh, to really do that. What what's necessary as far as backing out that much? I, I mean, I think yeah. if if stocks do stagnate for a year uh, and and if the economy really gets hit, then uh, then I, I think you know the. Obviously, I think the Fed will will cave and you know pause their interest rate hikes, or um, you know, or or even reverse them, reverse some of it altogether. Uh, so you you will get a bounce back. Yep. Now, longer term, you know, whether that whether that keeps us in, in kind of a sideways for for stocks, I, I think you can still make money if you're you know, if you're investing any time if you're investing you know, fifteen times PE ratio on the on the on the S and P five hundred. I mean, you've made money in the future mm-hmm. uh, just because of that multiple expansion and that kind of thing. You know, uh, companies are very good at uh, turning you know turning sales sales growth into higher profits and into leveraging those for, up for higher profits. So I, I don't I don't know that I see a secular bull bear market. I don't know. It's it's just it's just something that's that's hard to imagine with uh, with employment as good as it is uh, with the technolo- technological advances uh, that we're seeing. Uh, I mean, you know, things like AI, things like self driving, things like uh, you know, just that blockchain technology mm-hmm. uh, and, and that kind of thing is is really what drives those 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 ten year bull markets, right? Those 10, 15 year secular bull markets. Uh, it's those it's those big. Big uh, technology drivers that drive that economic growth and those changes that, that really drive the market, uh, and, mm-hmm. and there's just too many of those to to ignore. I think. I think that's a great place to leave this at. Unless you got any more questions, Dan. No, no, I think we covered uh, the things I wanted to talk about. I think we covered it. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming that's by, it. Joseph. Um, if you can, just uh, real quick, tell the people where they can find more about you if they want to learn more about uh, your website or the YouTube channel. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, yeah, that I mean, I'd love for anybody to come by the YouTube channel. Let's talk money and join the community there. Uh, love the the face to face interaction we get there, and just kind of a, a casual, informal kind of idea or nature. Uh, with the the blog, mystockmarketbasics.com, That's uh, again a little bit more, a little bit more basics. Uh, just the stuff to get you started investing and, and make sure you're on the right path. So, so either one, uh, love to see you there. I I signed up to the YouTube channel while we were talking. Awesome. <laughs> I yep. think you also have a uh, free newsletter too. We'll put a link for that in the episode description as well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I love, uh, you know, every week, uh, Sunday night. So before the market opens, just kind of what I'm looking, looking at during the week, stocks I'm watching, uh, where the economy is going in really that big picture that, that I love following so much because honestly it is, it is so much easier to, to take the big picture, use that to, uh, to, to guide your investing decisions rather than trying to pick one stock out of 5,000 and, and hope you get a winner. Right. All right, Dan, you want to take us home? Okay. Well, folks, thank you for sticking around to the end. I'd like to give a special thanks to Joseph Hogue. You can find him on uh, YouTube, Let's Talk Money. Thank you again, Joseph. This has been a really fantastic conversation. Your insights are greatly valued. 
and we appreciate you coming by. Maybe we'll get you back in the shop again sometime. We'll get you back in a year when the bear market to, to see if the bear market ended or not. See if it's actually over. <laughs> yeah. Because, see, what yeah. Were you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll play clips of your audio and we'll be total gotcha styles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you said a year ago, we I'm definitely, like, definitely 100% be out of this bear bullshit. <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking more about the military. <laughs> oh, we can do some more of that too. Come with your best sailor jokes next time. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee you'll get me cracking up even if Kyle I'll gets laugh. offended. Oh, I'll laugh. Folks, thanks for sticking around to the end again. We really appreciate it. Uh, but we do got to close up shop. And uh, don't worry. We'll be back opening back up soon with a regular episode. And until then, happy trades. Bye, folks. Two Bulls in a China Shop is an entertainment program, and all thoughts and opinions expressed in the show belong to the hosts and not of any company. They are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide entertainment about stocks and the financial industry of trading. If you make trades based on what you hear in this show, you assume all risks for those trades. If you look around, there are so many ways to make a difference. At Capella University, our FlexPath format gives you a different way to earn your degree. Take courses at your speed. Move on whenever you're ready. Education should fit your life. Learn more at capella.edu. Buy four tires and get up to $250 in savings after rebate at Bell Tire's 4th of July sale. Or get even more in Bell Tire gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Plus, get tires as low as $49 after rebate. Get up to $250 in savings. Or get even more in gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Get up to $250 in savings. Choose the lowest tire price, period, at Bell Tire. 100 years of getting folks safely back on the road, fast and affordably. See store at belltire.com for details. Restrictions apply.